Planes overhead spraying all my blue sky day away Spraying out the sun Now, if you've seen the uh, Peter Hyatt video of his um, with the Madeleine McCann subject Have you got a, a rough figure as to how many cases you've looked at? Um, hundreds techniques used to discern deception, but also content analysis. So it goes well beyond just saying if someone is lying or not, what are they lying about? Why are they lying? They are to sit down comfortably, choose their own words. They're given bottled water in a comfortable setting. There is no threats. There is no uh, coercion. Please tell us in your own words what happened. And the person says, well, where do I begin? Wherever you feel comfortable beginning. So we don't introduce any language to them or any words. Mm. person writes out what happened. If we are, then take that statement and properly analyze it in a scientific method, meaning we expect the same results, putting in the same data repeatedly, the investigator can now know this person did it, when he did it, how he did it, why he did it. Well, tell us what happened and what happened next. Those are the two most powerful questions that we have. What happened? What happened next? Mm -hmm. It allows them to choose whatever they want to choose, and, and this is an important point. The average person has an, a vocabulary of about 20,000 words. When you ask someone what happened, they must go into that vocabulary, decide what words to use out of the 20,000, where to order them, what verb tenses to use, what pronouns to use, where to place each word next to each other to communicate, in less than a microsecond of time. That is a process that when disrupted by deception, we catch. When someone uses an unnecessary word, unnecessary phrase, unnecessary detail, we deem it as doubly important. And when you ask them what happened, they must go into their memory, and when experiential memory speaks, it is very smooth and it goes in chronological order. A lie will disrupt that, and that causes internal stress. So people say, well, you know, sociopaths don't feel stressed when they're, when they're lying. That's not true. They feel very stressed when they're lying because they don't want to be caught. So to disrupt that process is very stressful, and those that are really good at lying will use a substitute of words. So one of the things they'll do, instead of saying, I did not use performance-enhancing drugs, they say, I never used performance-enhancing drugs. I would never. Uh, and what they're doing is they're actually distancing themselves from an actual denial. And what about qualifying words which change or weaken a statement? Tell us about that. Sure. Um, it can be used appropriately. It can be used inappropriately. If I said to you, I locked my keys in the car, you can be confident that I know where my keys are. They're locked in the car. If I said to you, I think I locked my keys in the car, that's called a weak assertion because I'm not certain if they're there. I did not shoot that man is very different from saying, I don't think I shot the man. Yeah. Um, you will know that I asked Peter Hyatt at the end of that interview, would he be prepared to analyze some NASA interviews? And he has done that. So I selected a seven minute long Neil Armstrong interview from 1970, transcribed it, and I've asked Peter to analyze it, which he's done. It cost me uh, $275 for the analysis. So that's what you've paid for, essentially, by coming here. So, um, so this interview aired on the sky at night on the 18th of November 1970, which is less than a year and a half after the moon landings. So everything should be pretty clear in Neil Armstrong's mind. So what you're going to see here is a very short clip of the interview, followed by Pitt Hyatt's analysis, then another clip, and then more analysis. So although it's only a seven minute long interview, it'll probably take me 20, 25 minutes to get through the analysis. So here goes. Earth and the moon. We note erm um, and er uh, as pauses in the answer and seek to determine if this is a habit of speech 
or if it is a signal that the subject needs more time to consider his answer. That he began with the sky is deep black indicates a willingness to answer the question directly. This is a somewhat lengthy answer which begins with two pauses for thought. The subject is presupposed to have been on the moon, something of great rarity at the time of this interview. The subject is intelligent and well-trained. The expectation is that he will, according to the wording of the question, report what he himself saw. In any singular or exclusive event, there is an expectation of heightened importance, and when we speak from experiential memory, the structure of the sentence is reliable. Expected. Given the unique experience of being on the moon, we first note that the subject does not begin his answer with the pronoun I. In analysis, this reduces reliability. Given the context of unique experience, the pronoun I would have shown the psychological strength of experiential memory. Its absence is noted. Even with influence from the interviewer, the expectation is the experiential use of I saw in some part of the answer. Next, we note the use of passive voice with when viewed from the moon. Passive voice removes the subject himself personally from the statement. The use of passivity is found in concealing identity and or responsibility in statements. For example, the gun went off is passive voice. If the subject was in a crowd and did not know who fired the gun, this would be appropriate. Here, the subject is describing a universal viewing and avoiding the singular experience that is expected. Next, when viewed from a uh, cislunar space, the space between the Earth and the Moon. This is similar to the universal pronoun you that is used to describe a common experience. This leads to a question. Is viewing the space between the Earth and the Moon a common experience that listeners would readily relate to? The, uh, the Earth is the only visible object other than the Sun that can be seen, although there have been some reports of seeing planets. This is his second sentence after reporting in both passive and universal language. He tells us in general terms what you, universal unnamed, can know, similar to what would be reported in a textbook. Please note the inclusion of some reports. He has thus far avoided giving us personal experience that is highly expected in such an event. This is an indication of avoidance of the response. There is no linguistic connection here between the subject and experiential language at this point. The rule of the negative. Truthful people tell us what they saw, heard, and experienced. When one tells us what they did not see, a la part one, or hear or experience, the analyst recognizes that this sentence increases in importance. I myself did not see planets from the surface, but I suspect they might uh, be visible. Here we not only have the rule of the negative, but we have the unnecessary addition of the word myself. Since he experienced something highly unique, not only does he report what he did not see, but he feels it necessary to input himself into the sentence where no such imputation should be needed. Who else would be answering this question, or not seeing what he did not see? He offers a weak assertion, I suspect they might be visible, appropriately matching might with suspect. Being that he has thus far not told us what he has seen, it is interesting to note the inclusion of the word suspect. What other word might he have chosen? I think they might be visible would be an appropriately weak assertion where one lacks certainty. The word think is the most commonly chosen. Therefore, we note the use of suspect or suspicion within his vocabulary in context of his answer. We continue to wait to hear him tell us what he saw. The Earth. With uh, white lace and <laughs> of the clouds, and the continents are clearly seen, although they have very little color from that distance. Okay, this is just an aside from myself. He said that from the moon, the Earth looks very small and remote. Now, the Earth is four times the diameter of the moon, and we're all used to seeing the moon in the sky and how big it is. So if you were to see something that big in the sky, would you call it small and remote? Here we have more sensory description, but we have not uh, heard him tell us what he himself saw. The description is strong, but is not yet connected to the subject. This could come from him, or it could come from a book or another's opinion. With such a stupendous history-making event, we expect to hear up-close personal language. Thus far, we have not. What about the sun? Do you see any trace of the corona? 
No, the uh, glare from the sun on the helmet visor was too difficult to pick out the corona. Here he says no, which answers the question, but then continues to avoid personal linguistic connection, such as, no, the glare of the sun on my helmet visor was too difficult for me to pick out the corona. This would have been a statement of personal connection, which he has not yet made. Remember, he was asked, did you, with the focus upon himself. He should answer for himself. The only time we could see the corona was during an eclipse of the sun from the moon, that is, when we were flying through the moon's shadow and could observe the, the, uh, the solar corona peeking out from behind the moon. Even if he said, the only time I could see was when we were flying, which would fulfill the personal, impactful event on self while sharing we when flying. Stronger is what I saw rather than we. The pronoun we could be produced if he and at least one other discussed this specific topic. Still, given the nature of a most unique and overwhelming event, the expectation remains. He should be using I and past tense verbs in correlation with sensory description. Please consider that given the spectacular and unique privilege of what he experienced, the pronoun me may be used in a desire not to claim any glory or credit for himself. This may be an indication of team over individual. Even with this accepted, we continue to expect him to at some point tell us what he experienced. Thus far, he has not. When the pronoun we is used consistently, we look for the first emergence of the pronoun I and conclude that the sentence containing it is very important. Looking at the photographs that you brought back, uh, the coloured photographs of the moon's surface, it seems that the colour of the surface actually varies according to the angle from which you see it. Is this so? Does it, uh, does it do this? Yes, it certainly does. So the wording is appropriate given the structure of the question. Does it do this? Answered by, it does. We do note the inclusion of certainly as an unnecessary emphasis. Uh, it's a characteristic that we observe first while uh, traveling around the moon in orbit. You can see that at the terminator. Rather than saying we saw and the stronger I saw, he only tells us what they could see at this point. What causes this weak assertion? Why does this historical and spectacularly unique event not yet produce a personal response from the subject? At the, uh, the, the boundary between the black part of the moon and the lighted part of the moon, uh, it was as if you were looking at a television set with the contrast turned uh, to f uh, mm. full contrast. Here he uses the universal you, second person, that is more likely used in, a, in commonly experienced issues, such as a television set contrast. Still, however, the lack of personal connection linguistically raises the question of personal impact upon the subject. What follows next is distancing language. Very black and very white. Uh, as you moved uh, further into the light, there were more and more shades of gray. But as you moved further, such the sun was higher above the horizon, you actually start to see the uh, tans and browns appear, although uh, at a very low level. This is distancing language, you, but the event described is specific to him and exclusively astronauts. There is nothing universal about the movement described. Whereas the listener can be referred to with the use of a television, the same cannot be said of space travel. Description is in the language, but there is no justification for the distancing use of the pronoun you in a very highly specialized and dramatic personal experience. Similarly, on the surface of the moon, the same characteristic is evident. Here, there is no pronoun I and no past tense verb. The pronoun I used with a past tense verb is a signal of linguistic commitment. Here, no use of I is also in a sentence where the present tense description is given. You can see uh, browns uh, if the sun is high enough. Apollo 12, for example, landed while the sun was only five yes. degrees above the horizon. So when they arrived, they saw no browns or tans anywhere, only fairly high contrast grays. He refers back to history and reports what is commonly and already known. The interviewer has asked him specifically for himself of his experiences. This general answer may have caused this next interruption. But you did. But, yes, I did. The sun was 11 degrees. And Apollo 12 did also. The next day, when, the, uh, when they arose from their sleeping period and the sun was higher, of course, then the browns were observable to them. 
We finally have the subject speaking for himself. Unfortunately, it is due to an interruption. When he said, yes, I did, we hold to an expectation that he would now include himself, I, and tell us the sensory descriptions that he holds within personal experiential memory. He does not. He went back to history from his previous answer. Therefore, we do not have the linguistic connection that remains expected. When you were actually walking about on the moon's surface and kicking about a certain amount of dust, did you notice any local colour? And also, were you at all subconsciously worried about the possibility of unsafe areas? The interviewer presumes he was walking on the moon. We have yet to hear Mr Armstrong make this claim, or more expectedly, since there is no accusation to the contrary, spoken or unspoken, the linguistic connection. Well, the colour is, is a puzzling phenomenon. that there is, in fact, some color, but the optical properties on the moon are most peculiar. The theme of distance continues in the description of color. First, he uses the self-reference that I've already mentioned, rather than engage in experiential memory. We note the first reference was also not first-person statement. Next, we note that he avoids telling us what he himself saw by using second-person universal you. You generally have the impression. It is impossible for anyone not there to have this impression, including the interviewer, who did not experience it. We prefer he state, without qualification, what he saw. He does not. When the pronoun I re-emerges, it is a weak assertion. I suspect that as we get, which is another disconnect from the formula of reliability. First person singular past tense with sensory description. When you are actually walking Far oh, things look quite near. <laughs> the topic is sight. The one being interviewed is singular. We look for him to answer with I saw in some form. Sensory is very individual. When it is discussed, one may then say the thoughts or perceptions of another. But here he is interviewed alone and is being asked for first person eyewitness account. He does not give a first person singular account. of the moon than we have here on Earth, of course, four times greater. And the fact that uh, it is an irregular surface with uh, crater rims overlying other crater rims, uh, you, you can't see the real horizon. You're seeing hills that are somewhat closer to you. Uh, there was a large crater, uh, which we overflew during our final approach, which was, it had hills of the order of 100 feet in height. And uh, we were only 11, 1,200 feet west of that hill, and we couldn't see a 100-foot high hill from 11 to 1,200 feet away. Perception. He does not speak for himself, including in the realm of perception. This is to address the brain's interpretation of what was seen or experienced. He consistently in the interview tells us what we saw, we thought, we perceived, as well as what you saw, and so on. Although many of these topics were likely discussed, he should still be speaking for himself. This use of we is most unexpected. We must now consider that if he is not deceptive, uh, why does he have a reason to join a crowd even in personal experience and perception? Did you notice any obvious difference between the far side and the near side as he went around it? I mean, apart from the obvious difference in topography. No 
observable distant uh, differences in color, uh, but then uh, the sun's angle was always somewhat different over there, so it would be difficult to make a uh, general uh, correlation. Mm. Uh, I would say the topography is the striking yes, change. Yes. Of course, as uh, all your viewers mm -hmm. know, there are no seas on the far <laughs> side of the moon, and it is, uh, it's all uh, highlands and uh, high mountains, big craters, so uh, it's strikingly different from the... The weakness continues. I would say the topography is future conditional tense. Even in this singular opinion, he does not give a reliable connection. There's just one more, thing I'd, one more thing I'd like to ask you. Uh, you're one of the very, very few people, I think, whose opinion on this is really worth having. In fact, there are only four of you. Do you think, from your knowledge of the moon, having been there, that it is going to be possible in the foreseeable future to set up scientific bases there on anything like a large scale? Oh, I'm quite certain that we'll have such bases uh, in our lifetime. Uh, somewhat like the Antarctic stations uh, and similar scientific outposts, continually manned. Although, uh, certainly, there's the problem of the environment, the vacuum, and the high and low temperatures of day and night. Still in all, in many ways, it's more hospitable than Antarctica might be. Uh, there are no storms, no snow, no high winds, no unpredictable weather uh, phenomena that we're yet uh, aware of. And the gravity is a very pleasant kind of place to work in, better than here on Earth. And uh, I, I think it would be quite, quite a pleasant place to do scientific work and quite practical. Mr. Armstrong, thank you very much. And again, let me say what a tremendous honor and privilege it's been to have you with us. Thank you. Here we have the use of two personal connections, I, with both qualified. The first is, oh, I'm quite certain that we'll have such bases in our lifetime. Here he is not only certain, but calls upon the reinforcement of being quite certain. The second use is with a slight stutter on the pronoun I, which suggests the possibility of increase of nervousness. In analysis, this is called the stuttering I and is used to measure anxiety. We use the pronoun I millions of times in life. The brain's efficiency is extreme in this regard. When a non-stutterer halts or stutters on the pronoun I, the commitment psychologically comes into question with nervousness, possibly moving into anxiety and tension. He moves the topic to Antarctica, which is similar to going to another Apollo mission above. Yet we ask, what topic produced the stutter on the pronoun I? The emotion produced regarding a space station. And uh, I, I think it would be quite, quite a pleasant place to do scientific work and quite practical. The emotion he relates to the future station is pleasant for a specific reason, to do scientific work. Why might this create nervousness or even stress? Okay, so Peter Hyatt now gives his um, conclusions. He says, Neil Armstrong does not linguistically connect himself to the lunar landing. This is evident in his consistent distancing language, including intuitive pronouns and passivity. What may have caused this? So Peter Hyatt now gives four possibilities. Remember, he's a professional analyst, so he's covering his bases here with these four possible reasons. And you'll see in a moment why I'm saying that. So the first possibility is that it, there's a, there is a security mandate. So Neil Armstrong's being told, you're not allowed to tell anyone about what you saw, right? The second is that this is his baseline. So in other words, he talks like this all the time, even when he's talking to his wife. So... <clears throat> Say his wife said, Neil, did you enjoy yourself at the pub? He would say, when you go to the pub, you do enjoy yourself. If, if you have a beer with your friends. He goes around talking like that. All right, so I don't, I don't put much credibility in option two. Option three, he's a liar. He's deceptive. Lack of commitment mimics deceptive language. The lack of personal commitment in context is stark. Like I say... Um, Peter Hyatt obviously didn't want to put all his eggs in one basket. The fourth is unknown. Okay, so he's, he's, he's hedging his bets a little bit. Um, but I know where my belief lies there. In my personally, I think it's number three. I, I don't think Neil Armstrong walked on the lunar surface. And you've also got to bear in mind here that Peter Hyatt is an American who completely believed the Apollo story. He wasn't aware of any conspiracy stuff before he did this analysis. So this is a 100% believer. Okay, so in his emails with me after he did this analysis, this is what he said. This was so unexpected that I ran it by another analyst. I grew up at age seven with this account. 
There's a strong emotional connection with childhood national pride. The teachers repeatedly visited it, including newsreels. I did not expect this. I originally felt guilty wasting your money. Your money. But after the first few answers where he is linguistically nowhere to be found, I realized that there is more here than what is ridiculed. Heather too, that's his wife, who was also a trained analyst, is shocked. We both said the same thing. Things we dismissed as crazy years ago have been proven true more and more. We need to stay more open and explore. Okay, so this is, this is the person who was with the person who does not linguistically connect himself to the lunar surface. Buzz Aldrin, who looks more and more like a lunatic every day. Um, now, the next interview I'm going to get Peter Hyatt to analyse is this one. Buzz Aldrin being interviewed by Bart Zabrell. This is a very, very different interview to the one that you've just watched, right? Because Buzz Aldrin is actually put on the spot and he's directly challenged, you did not walk on the moon. And in my opinion, he almost admits it. He says, we were on a flight, you need to ask NASA. So <laughs> I suspect that the transcript from this interview is going to throw up more than that previous one. Okay, so what's going on here? If they didn't land Apollo 11 on the moon, did they land 12 or 14 or 15? Because there are six missions that NASA claim landed on the moon. Did any of them go? Were they getting a bit nearer each time? Well, let's present some evidence from Apollo 17, the last mission which supposedly landed on the lunar surface. Um, here are two photographs from that mission. If we look at the top one, um, we've, we've featured this on Rich Planet before, but I think it's important to go through it again. So. What we're led to believe here, if you just look at the top image, is that the lunar lander has come down, it's landed on the lunar surface, the astronauts have got out, they've climbed down this ladder, and they've walked towards the camera. One of them's turned around and taken a snapshot of the lunar lander with some hills in the background. They've then continued walking in the same direction, 150 metres. One of them has then started doing a little experiment, the other one turns around and takes a photograph of him with the background. So you can see the lunar lander here in the two shots. Now just look at the backdrops, look how similar they are. Look at Hill B here with this shading on it. What are the chances on earth if me and you get out of a car and I take a photograph of the car and then we walk 150 meters down the road and I take a photograph of you with a car in the background, what are the chances of getting an almost identical backdrop, right? Now a skeptic contacted me and said, no, no, the backdrops aren't identical if you look very closely. There's slight differences in shadows and things here. Well, if what they tell us is true, that, the, that it was front screen projection system that was used, i.e. thousands of tiny beads uh, reflecting an image, perhaps these uh, images were also taken on, the, on a different day, you are going to get di uh, differences. They're not going to be identical. It would, it's not like compositing a green screen image where the images would be identical. So you would expect slight differences in shadow and that kind of thing, which is exactly what we see. So this is, this is very strong evidence, in my opinion, that those, these photographs are taken in a studio. People have even worked out the size of this studio. You're talking a huge studio, probably in a hangar, uh, of the order of 300 meters uh, to the actual backdrop. Uh, so um, it doesn't look good for NASA. Now, this doesn't prove that Apollo 17 didn't land. It just proves that they've faked some photographs uh, in a studio, or it's strong evidence that they've faked some photographs in a studio. So. I think they're very, very worried about this evidence, the evidence of Apollo 11, and the new evidence that I've just showed you, because um, it doesn't look good for NASA. And that's why we get articles like this one. This appeared in the Metro newspaper last year, titled, Here's Why the Moon Landings Weren't Faked. New Conspiracy Study Proves It. So they feel the need to deny moon conspiracy theories. So it says, in the wilder reaches of the internet, lots of people still believe that NASA faked the moon landings and possibly even its entire space program. But it's absolute balls, a new study has shown. It would have simply uh, been impossible to keep it a secret, according to Oxford scientists. If the moon landings had been a hoax involving an estimated 411,000 people, it would have been found out in three years and eight months. <laughs> British physicist Dr. David Grimes worked out a mathematical way to calculate the chances of a plot being deliberately leaked by a whistleblower or accidentally uncovered. 
Now then, what this shows is that Dr. David Grimes has done no research into what Moon ho uh, Hoax researchers claim, right? So if you read one of the earliest books by Bill Casing, written in the 1970s, called We Never Went to the Moon, he explains that the whole thing was done without informing all of NASA. In fact, only informing a tiny handful of people. It's all in his book. So why hasn't David, uh, Dr. Grimes looked at this book? So in Bill Casing's book, uh, Bill Casing was a technologist. He worked on some of the Apollo technology. Um, he explains, yes, there was a visible NASA Apollo program, um, but there was also another secret project called the ASP, the Apollo Simulation Project. This is all in Bill Casing's book. And he claims that they had a secret base in Nevada, so a considerable sum of money spent on this group that was used to hoax the mission between um, four and seven billion dollars. But even that group, even the secret group that was hoaxing the mission was being run to Manhattan Project style rules. So only a few people underneath actually knew what was going on. So the Manhattan Project to develop the atomic bomb, only six people knew what they were doing. And Bill Casing claims that with the, with the hoax moon landings, uh, it was the same. So let me give you a little example. In my career as an engineer, the company I worked for used to build these things. This is a, a, a generator in a power station. Produces the electricity that comes in your home. So I worked for a company called NEI that used to build these. And I worked in the control systems department. So when you have a huge generator like, like this, you have a rack of electronics called an AVR, Automatic Voltage Regulator which would look something like that, and it's controlling all aspects of that generator, the voltage and the frequencies and that kind of thing. Now, what you, will, what you do not do is build your control system and just plug it in and expect it to work, because these cost millions of pounds to build. So what you do is you build a, you build a simulator. So you, it's a box of electronics which will emulate in every respect that piece of hardware, that 500 megawatt generator. And in my time at NEI, this is one of the projects that I was involved with. There's the specifications, Richard. There's an electronics lab. Go ahead and build the generator simulator. So once that's built, the AVR, the control system, is then plugged into it. And then it's used, so the simulator is used to test and debug the control system. So you know that it's all working correctly because you've, you've proved it with a simulator. And only then do you take it to your power station and then you know it's going to work. So the point I'm making is that simulators are a very important part in engineering. They're used all over the place. I've worked on two or three different simulator projects in my time as an engineer. Now, if you consider the control desks at NASA for these various Apollo missions, um, some of these desks might be just monitoring things on the mission. Others might be actually sending data to the mission and controlling things. So all this technology would need to be tested. You wouldn't just build these desks and then use it live on a mission. You would build a simulator. So that simulator would simulate everything in the Apollo uh, rocket, and it would simulate all of the communication data. Now that simulator might be in the same room. It could be in a different. Uh, it could be in a different city because it's a comms simulator. But the point is, engineers would be tasked to build a simulator to test the control room. <clears throat> now those guys would not be told, "Hey, we're going to use this to fake the mission." But that technology that they had built could well be. <clears throat> so the same applies to the sets. They wouldn't, if they're building these 300 meter sets with their front screen projection systems, right? They're not going to tell all the guys building them what they're being, what they're for. Well, we're hoaxing the mission lads. Come on, we put the front screen projection up. They don't, that's not how they work. They're told, well, this is for publicity. Okay. So that's how it works. And it's all explained in Bill Casing's 1970s book, We Never Went to the Moon. So as I say, Dr. David Grimes has done no work, no research. So I wrote to Dr. David Grimes to tell him this, and um, I didn't get a reply. So I, I explained to him what I've just explained to you, and I sent him a link to this book, little booklet that I've written all about Mars. Um, because as you may know, you may have seen some of the programs on Rich Planet. I've been working on this for a number of years now, and I'm fairly convinced now. It is a hypothesis, so I wouldn't stake my life on it, right? But I'm fairly convinced that none of the um, rovers and landers that they say they've sent to Mars landed on the, on the Martian surface. I challenge anyone to read this book and then um, after it think that they're on Mars. 
And in my opinion, it's been done in, this, in a very similar fashion to how they did it with Apollo, <laughs> where, the, where all these guys here who really did build a rover and it they really did send it to the rocket, etc. But it never went to Mars. But all these guys believe it is on Mars. That's, that's how the conspiracies are run, in my opinion. And I communicated with this guy, Robert Manning, a senior engineer on the Curiosity Project. And he agreed to answer any technical question that I put to him. So Andrew Johnson and myself, we drafted up 26 questions. And he answered one question and ran away from the rest. So if you want to read all of those questions and the emails that I've shared with uh, Robert Manning, it's all in that book. And you can decide for yourself whether you think they're lying or not. Okay, and just um, this Sunday, just gone, I noticed I was filling my van up with petrol on the way here. And uh, this is the front page of the Sunday Times after I've just presented this new Peter Hyatt research, yeah? Front page of the Times, the last men on the moon win two tickets to see the astronauts. Is that a coincidence? <laughs> Makes you laugh. So I'd like now to add some additional information that I've recorded after the talk. I just want to bring people's attention to this film, Operation Avalanche, because in my opinion, it's a very clever piece of disinformation. Uh, the film itself follows a group of CIA operatives who are spying on NASA, and they accidentally discover that NASA, or a small part within NASA, is planning to fake the moon landings. Now, in my opinion, this film speaks to two distinct audiences. The first audience that it speaks to is the audience that already believe the moon landings were faked. And what I think the message is that it's trying to put out to that group is that if the moon landings were faked, then it wasn't authorised. Um, you can't blame the government or NASA or, or the CIA or intelligence agencies. It was a renegade group within NASA that nobody had control of. So it's trying to dispel any blame from, from the current system. The second group that I think this film is speaking to is the larger group, which just believe the moon landings happened as they were reported. Now in this film, there's much evidence that moon hoax research has put forward is, is covered. So the Stanley Kubrick front screen projection is mentioned. The famous sea rock is mentioned. And many, many other pieces of evidence is mentioned in this film. So it's as if they're trying to mop up all of the evidence that moon hoax researchers have come forward with in order to debunk the moon landings. And they've put it in this film to present it in a slightly wacky way to people who believe the moon landings were real. So if those people then encounter that evidence at a later date, they're more likely to dismiss it because they've seen it in this wacky film. So that's what I think this film is up to. A very clever piece of disinformation. I'm going to read some comments now from Wikipedia about NASA. Just to point out, I don't read from Wikipedia because it represents truth. I read from Wikipedia because it represents the official narrative. It, it, it represents what NASA has told the public. So this is the first comment I want to draw people's attention to. Apollo set major milestones in human spaceflight. It stands alone in sending manned missions beyond low Earth orbit and landing humans on another celestial body. So just consider that. Nobody else, no country, no organisation other than the Apollo moon missions have sent anyone beyond low Earth orbit. Now, if you consider the evidence that I've just presented, it's quite possible that those Apollo moon missions did not go beyond low Earth orbit. So what this is telling me, at least in the white world, the acknowledged space projects, possibly none of them have gone beyond low Earth orbit. Here's another quote from Wikipedia. The first manned flight of Orion, that's the new rocket that they're developing, and SLA, Exploration Mission 2, EM2, is to launch between 2019 and 2021. It is a 10 to 14 day mission planned to place a crew of four into lunar orbit. So it's going to take them till 2020 just to get a man to orbit the moon. Now, according to NASA, there were eight missions in the 1960s which orbited the moon with men in the spacecraft. That was 50 years ago. So why is it taking them up until 2020 to do the same? 
In my opinion, this is more evidence that those 1960s missions probably did not go anywhere near the moon. Here's another quote. On December the 4th, 2006, NASA announced it was planning a permanent moon base. The goal was to start building the moon base by 2020 and by 2024 have a fully functional base. In 2010, President Barack Obama halted existing plans, including the moon base, and directed focus on manned missions to asteroids and Mars, as well as extending support for the International Space Station. So that's very, very unusual. What he's done, he's cancelled this moon project and replaced it with much more far-fetched or much more difficult projects, landing someone on an asteroid or on Mars. So again, I think this is, could be evidence that we haven't been, at least in the white world, we haven't been beyond low Earth orbit. And that brings about the question, is there some sort of constraint? Now, I've spoken about NASA, and I would suggest that NASA's projects, some of them are fraudulent, not all of them. I think some of the unmanned projects have been real. I think the space shuttle was real. I think the International Space Station is real. But I'm very doubtful about whether Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, and I'm very doubtful about whether any of the Mars rover missions are real. So NASA's running frauds, in my opinion.